Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, especially the MAP uh, committee for starting our session on time because some of our guests had to leave for another commitment. Um, today, the topic of our uh, panel discussion is very different. Okay. Um, if uh, I go back for last one decade, every press conference, uh, every uh, conference or every uh, talk that I've been, one topic that used to be um, very common was uh, millennial. It was the buzzword. And uh, wherever you go, uh, if you were not talking about millennials, uh, either you were obsolete or there was something wrong in the conversation. So uh, there's a good news that uh, millennials are done and we are entering into a next generation and that generation is called uh, Gen Z. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are aware that what Gen Z is, these are the people who are born from 1995 till 2010, these 15 years, but uh, there's a paradigm shift in their environment. Uh, these are the kids who are born uh, with five devices in their hand. They are more educated. They are more uh, data driven. They have more knowledge. They are more research oriented. So uh, today we are going to talk about the new world of Generation Z and how the marketeers and uh, the people who are running the business, how will they uh, uh, coop up with and how, will they, how much are they ready for the next generation? So I'll put the first question to the panel uh, and I'll start with uh, Fahad that how do you see the Gen Z uh, being different from millennials, the last generation, and uh, what are their basic traits? So if you can highlight on that. Uh, so, um, Jajis, a lot has been said about this. So, what, and, and we obviously see a lot of uh, interviews and f uh, Facebook posts and stuff about Gen Z. So what I did a couple of months ago, maybe a year and a half back, was was actually decided to immerse myself into a social experiment, to actually start feeling it myself and try to understand what is really going on with, with this generation because we employ a lot of people from, the, from Gen Z. I mean, everybody who's now coming into the organization is, is from that generation. So I basically went on, a, um, uh, on an exchange program to Lumps as a student, undercover, and I spent a couple of... Um, uh, days uh, studying what they were studying, hanging out with them, just trying to figure out exactly what, uh, what is it. And there's one thing that came out strikingly from that immersion. And that one thing was that these people are, are um, uh, they have so many choices and they, 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 the decision making power is very good compared to the earlier generations. So if you would see them, you'd basically take classes, they, they have a lot of electives that they need to choose from. They choose whether they want to continue to sitting in a class or they want to exit the class at the middle of the lecture if they th don't think it's adding any value to them. You, as you rightly said, they have a lot of devices and access to data, so you can't fool them. Uh, so one thing that I think strikingly defines the new generation is essentially their power <coughs> to decide. At the same time, um, they are obviously, they need to have, um, they need to be convinced on everything and they need to get in, in, engage in a very detailed conversation. So that's, that's, I would say, was the starting point for me, and, and I think that's how we deal with, with the generation. 10% of our organization today is Gen Z already, uh, and its number is gonna keep on increasing. So we have to understand how to keep them engaged through and through. Um, and because they're very purpose-oriented and they need an explanation, they, they're very good at, um, at, at figuring out what is their style, what is, what is part of their values and what not. So, so you have to really be convincing for them and make yourself relevant to these guys. Okay. Uh, Abbas, do you agree with uh, Fahad and his uh, social experiment? Well, this is a great social experiment. Fahad, very inspirational. I'll also try that one out. Yeah, it, it's, it's actually a lot of fun, to be honest. You, it makes you uncomfortable, to be honest. The first time I was attending the class, I actually felt the shrills as if it was my first day at the university because I was so scared that the professor is gonna call me out and ask me a difficult question. <laughs> <coughs> so yes, I think uh, when you talk about Generation Z, I think firstly what we need to understand is it's about generational marketing, right? So uh, how are different generations different from each other? Because human beings are the same, right? What you are today, 
the person who was, let's say, your great grandfather was also a human being. He also had the same, you know, two arms and two legs, and a, you know, and a soul and some hopes about the society and some fears. So, so the human being doesn't change as such. What's different is that there are certain events which happen uh, in the course of your life which define you, and some big events happen uh, that define the whole generation. So the last generation, so to say, the millennials, uh, they were affected by 9-11. Uh, it was a global event which also had a huge impact on our country. Uh, but now that's past, right? 9-11 happened uh, about 17 years ago. The kids who are coming in now, they're being affected by other things. And uh, when we do, uh, as Coca-Cola, uh, our target audience is people primarily who are under the age of 30, so they're all Gen Z as such. Uh, so we have regular, um, in-depth understanding, uh, deep dives uh, with these people. We see that these people are much more hopeful about the society and their future. Um, they have seen things come up from bad to good. Um, and you may not agree uh, with some of the political changes which have happened, um, but impartial of that, they see that there is a change, uh, and some of them are hopeful. Uh, they have also seen some other good things come up, for example, PSL. Uh, while cricket was not in Pakistan for many years, but they saw that there is a revival. Uh, from an internet perspective, I'll totally agree uh, that they have more choices, therefore they feel more empowered. Um, so while they're hopeful and they're positive, uh, they also are much more self-reliant. Uh, and with that comes um, a little bit of a, uh, you can say that they don't trust the system as such. They don't trust the government, they don't trust the media. Uh, they don't trust anyone else, so they want to uh, understand from each other uh, and their uh, references of their friends, uh, what should they buy, uh, what should be their opinions about different things in the world. So as we go forward, I think the challenge for, uh, for the marketeers and, and generally the entire society uh, will be that uh, uh, will the, these people who are right now hopeful and they're positive about the, about the, about the future, uh, they can also get distracted very quickly. Um, and we will see, I think it's only time will tell uh, whether their hopes are fulfilled or not. Uh, but from a marketeer perspective, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great generation to talk to. And uh, we should take advantage of that, we should try to create more positive experiences, uh, and that's how our brands will also grow. Okay, so I'll put my question to focus off now that uh, with Generation Z, what cultural transformation of change that you see with the new breed coming in in the corporate sector and into the consumer market? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, both the gentlemen uh, have uh, given a premise on the, on the concept of Generation Z. I would like to take you back into history uh, as far as marketing is concerned. There was a day of the producer 200 years back Anybody who could produce something could sell. Then there was a day of the transporter, the sea vessels. They would go overseas. Big corporations were made during those times. They could bring the produce from one end of the world to another world. So the shippers, the sailors, the shipping companies, they were the people who ruled the world. Then came another thing, which is called the information age where neither the producer nor the shipper is going to sell, is the consumer itself who's going to sell. Because the understanding of the consumer is far better in the Generation Z, vis a vis it used to be 30 years back, 40 years back, and 50 years back. Another thing which is a reality of the fact today is that we do not have to challenge or analyze Generation Z it's a reality of the fact. It's not a challenge. It's an asset to the modern society, the modern world. I asked myself one day that in my 30s, I had a lot of energy, good skills of the day, and I was a fast and furious marketeer. But once I'm in my 40s, I did carry some skills. I had more experience and authority, but my energy was not as good as it used to be once I was in my 30s. <coughs> but now once in, I am in my 50s, I do not carry those skills which people in their 30s and early 40s are carrying, or people are in their late 20s, which is Generation Z. So what do I sell? How do I convince? 
So I have then two things remaining with me. I don't have that much energy. That's a reality. I don't have those skills. So what I carry with me is my wisdom and my experience of a track record of a 30 years career, which I can coach, I can teach, and I can contribute to Generation Z and let them lead the marketing focus. Now that's the reality of the fact. Now coming to Generation Z themselves, as my friend just said, it's now not a premium brand you're selling. It's not a brand for joy. We still like to buy a Lamborghini, but that's a quest of the richness and the economic race which have, we have this in the world, material world, I would say. But many of the Generation X people, I lived in China for many years, <clears throat> they want to be entrepreneurs. They want to be brand by themselves. They do not want to work with big companies. My own son does not work, want to work with any company. He wants to create his own brand. Why? The reason is that the today's Generation Z is more equipped with the information age, with the skills they carry today because of the IT transformation and automation, and the confidence in himself or herself that they can do better. So just by telling them that, you know, you have to go for this brand will not suffice. The corporations have to work multifold. A, they have to be present and not present on the media or the television. They have to be present in the society. That's how you are going to touch Generation Z. Two, you have to be doing the brand marketing, but you have to do the social marketing as well. Because the Generation Z will not accept if something is wrong. They want to make a decision or equation between a company who is good and a company who is bad. A company which is ethical and a company which is not ethical. So that a decision which a, your consumer is going to take today. And we as marketeers have to decide that how do we club social marketing <coughs> vis a vis as biz business marketing to ensure that my brand is present and integrating in the society today of the Generation Z. If it's a premium brand, and I'm still thinking the old-fashioned way, wow, I'm selling Daimler Mercedes, that's not gonna sell 10 years down the road. You have to prove that if Mercedes is digging cobalt for their something in Africa, and that poor children are dying, there could be a day people just stop buying that particular product. Or if somebody comes to know that, you know, for marketing gimmicks, iPhone is trying to you know, for example, do some software which is going to slow down their telephone and like mobile phone in some years of time. But before iPhone wizards could really analyze their or redo their marketing strategy, the Generation Z already knew that's one, what's wrong with the iPhone. So the news and the information age is traveling faster than what we can comprehend today. So I would say adaption to technology, yes, Global focus, one world, we have to look at global emerging economies, and we have to give space to Generation Z, welcome their ideas. We work with, with them, we walk with them, and we learn from them, and they learn from our wisdom and experience, and then how we collaborate. But my bottom line would be the brands with Generation Z has to live and work with the society. You have to club business marketing, social marketing, and the essence of ethics of your business into your product and brand. That's how you're gonna c convince Generation Z that okay, this is the right brand, this is the right product, and this is the right thing, either as part of my career, or as part of, as part of my daily life, or can I be a consumer of a certain product? Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, now I'll put the question to Haseeb, who has a very different, we were just talking earlier, and he has a very different perspective of this generation and how marketers have evolved these uh, different ways of creating a self model where they can focus more on the new needs. So I think uh, how Generation Z will affect your marketing strategies, because you being in a FMCG uh, organization, 
will your marketing strategies will considerably change you will have to do something different or the same uh, strategies will be working for next 10 or 15 years so thank you jarjis for kind of spilling the beans on that i suppose uh, without uh, sounding too controversial uh, I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about an anecdotal experience i had a few years ago when i was working in the uk my boss, a lovely lady, Irish uh, lady, came to me and said that, uh, you know, there's a, there was a global project that had been initiated to market product to Muslims in Europe. And uh, she said, I'm not very aware of the cultural sensitivities of uh, what, you know, Muslims have as such, but we've got a global center of excellence and we were wondering, even though it's not your responsibility, if you could be kind enough to help us. So I thought, you know, that's no problem. Happy to, you know, sort of throw in some insights if I could help. And so I sat down with a pan-European group of people, and they were talking about a bit of a disaster that they'd had in one of the countries. So uh, they said, we, we launched uh, you know, uh, an assortment of Muslim food in Germany, and that was very successful. But when we took that food and we started marketing it in France, it, it absolutely bombed. Uh, so firstly, I was quite fascinated with this concept of Muslim food because you know, it was something quite alien to myself. And it turned out that what they were thinking was Muslim food was actually Turkish food. And because Turkish, there's a lot of Turkish people in Germany uh, that, you know, obviously assortment became very successful. But when that Muslim food, which was actually Turkish food, transferred itself to France, where you have a significant Algerian Muslim population, obviously that did not resonate with the, with, with the audience there. And so the question that I was being asked is that if we take this Muslim food and bring it to the UK, you know, do you think it'll work? And I had to tell them first that, you know, uh, it's quite dangerous sometimes when you take a heterogeneous group of people with different attitudes and different behavioral <coughs> norms and you cluster them all together and you call them by a certain name that in a lot of ways is stereotyping. So <coughs> I suppose the concern I have now coming to gen Generation Z is that if we were to take, uh, you know, uh, people from a certain gender and say that based on this gender, this is how you will behave, that would be considered very sexist. If we were to do that based on racial color, again, that would be considered racist. So I find it quite, uh, you know, challenging when we take a group of people uh, who are heterogeneous by nature in a lot of ways, uh, and we say that because of their age, we will cluster them all together. So I appreciate the fact that a new generation has different ideas, different perspectives, different values. You know, when we were growing up, you know, I always had my father telling me that how different I was from him, and I can see how different my daughters are from me. But I think where I struggle is sometimes when you create a segment like we created millennials, uh, you know, a few years ago, it was all, you couldn't have a meeting anywhere without saying the M word. You know, if you didn't say millennials, you were a dinosaur in marketing. Millennials weren't too, too different from the rest of the lot. And there's a lot of research done in marketing in this. I'd urge the audience to read a guy called Mark Ritson. He's one of the most eminent marketing thinkers in the world. He's done a lot of research in this area. Uh, read Byron Sharp, uh, who, who spoke about how brands grow. A lot of these guys talk about the fact that sometimes we create these segments which are not necessarily segments. You know, if you look, if you remember the principle of segmentation that most of us learned in business school, a segment is something that behaves differently. Uh, I don't think Generation Z is a segment. I think it's an attitude. I think a lot of us have changed. I'm sure a lot of the panelists who are sitting here grew up watching PTV, you know, one single channel. I remember watching Thunder Sub five minutes the whole week. Uh, we had to wait for it. And now, of course, children, you know, watch 24-hour cartoon networks and, you know, they've got access through YouTubes and all that. But so do we, you know, it's not like we don't watch dramas on, the, on digital, it's not like we are complete aliens from Generation Z. So I think that's the, the danger always here is, and while I absolutely agree with what the panelists have said, especially I think what Fahad has done is awesome, um, you know, going and meeting younger people, I think the danger is sometimes when you categorize people based on age, and then you think all of those people behave exactly the same way, I think that's very dangerous because we've not seen that in the millennials, we've not seen that in Gen X, we've not seen that in baby boomers, and these are all categorizations that are created till something new happens. But see, what's I, I, I just like to add something into here. I mean, I, I personally believe that the, the topic we are discussing is primarily not categorizing people 
into a box actually. It's a cultural, social, technological and behavioral transformation of change which happens due to our circumstances which we live in. Why we called ourselves millennials was that in thousand years the things human beings could not do, they have started doing it in just one hundred years. So that's why we call them Generation M. And then came the Generation X, then you, we see that Generation So because the 9,500 years back or 10,000 years of known human history, this is the first time that human being is uh, working on computers and they are aided by automation and machines instead of uh, human labor and mind alone. So that's a assistance you get from. So these are the technological uh, circumstances which affects us to change our behavior, how we give our outputs under those circumstances. So I would rather call it that, okay, we have named it as such that, but I don't think uh, that we are classifying like it's a, it's a difference between a black and white or a difference between millennial or generation X or Y or Z. I think it's just a human evolution, but the speed is so fast that in 10,000 years with human, known, uh, human history, people could not do things that are happening in this year. In my, once I was in my teens and early twenties, things would, what would happen in five or eight years, they are now happening in six months, for example. And, uh, you know, somebody used to do a research sitting in Africa for ten years and writing a book and then people would read that book that, okay, this was the research outcome. Now somebody sees a documentary for Nat Geo one hour and they exactly know end to end what happens for a lion's life in a whole uh, span of their life or an elephant for that matter, for, for example. So okay, this um, knowledge, etc. The, yeah. the point so, was so my, my point is I agree to you, but I think we all believe with you that it's not a classification, it's how we, our generation Z or myself or anybody else is behaving under a changing world where their circumstances are changing as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think let's move forward. And Freya, you cater to, uh, you, you uh, are uh, with, from the company which uh, primarily targets uh, females, also uh, mothers. So you think in next uh, few years, your marketing and your target, uh, the focus of your marketing will change uh, from uh, existing portfolio of uh, mothers to a new segment, which is just coming up. I mean, I tend to agree what Haseeb just pointed out, which is like uh, when we look at various generations, whether we talk of Gen X or Z or millennials, it is really a mindset uh, and you can't box them. I mean, we, we wouldn't be able to box them there. So I mean, it, uh, in a broader perspective, uh, when we say Gen, Gen Z, it is a Gen Z mindset. So when I um, look at the kind of business we run, um, our, our primary target consumer being housewives, uh, we have to see how the trends are changing because these are all indicative of trends. And right now the changing trends, if I were to give an example, is for example, when we were growing up, it was the age of different kind of influencers, for example. Um, Pepsi co-using Michael Jackson, okay? So Pepsi, Pepsi was Michael Jackson, right? Or yeah. was it Coke? It was Pepsi. Pepsi. So it was Michael the Jackson. The next generation. Uh, I mean, the, the influencers were different. If you look at the new age mothers, uh, I mean, this is the age of social media, okay? So they are going to get influenced or the influencer groups are things like she ops or it is um, uh, uh, yummy mummy, or you know these, they, they look more towards uh, uh, peer, uh, their peer group and that. So for us marketeers, I mean there are some big changes happening on the horizon and um, I mean this is a daily conversation we have back in the office also. I mean if you look at Pakistan, we would say that uh, 60, 70 percent of our budget still goes behind television. So in a lot of ways, uh, it's television, outdoor, and 
print somewhere, which is still dominating our conversation. If I look at the future, I think that this is not going to work, really. I mean, this strategy is not going to work because you've got so much data out there. You've got so much, we've got so much knowledge out there. And in the next uh, 10 years, they're going to be some fun. That's the relevance of Gen Z. Because uh, as we speak, uh, Gen Z is almost going to end. It's the next generation that is going to start. And the entire, it's the entire ecosystem which, which changes, it is not, uh, I mean, it's end to end. I also visited a school, by the way, to see <laughs> what the next generation is doing. And uh, I, we had heard about these things like STEM robotics. Okay, so how many people here know what exactly is STEM robotics? Okay, but in schools, it is, uh, they are already adopting STEM robotics. From class one onwards, I mean, this is this is our future. And whether you talk, I mean, whether you talk women or whatever, I mean, irrespective of gender, this is where we are headed. And women are going to be our target consumers are going to be no different. So next ten years, I see, a, I see an extremely digitized world, and we will have we need to you know I mean we have to we are, we are still have not broken that mold. So we are looking to break that mold and, and to see how we can use so much data available more positively uh, and uh, more positively for our business and to, I mean more efficiently for that matter, to specifically target uh, these younger mothers and you know the changing mindset that they are so going through. So basically as a panel we all agree that Gen Z is a mindset. And this yes. mindset is based on the environment that we have uh, for the last uh, two decades. Uh, the interesting part is that, as you mentioned, uh, and a very important point that you just mentioned, that uh, the influences. I think uh, for generation, next generation that we used to call the Michael Jackson generation, uh, <laughs> that generation used to rely, or the marketers of that time used to rely on role models, uh, be it uh, Michael Jackson, be it Imran Khan, Wasim Akram. But now the scenario has changed with millennials coming in and now Generation Z and maybe the Generation Alpha, which is the next generation right now we, that's taking place. Uh, what happens is that the role models have changed into influencers. And these influencers are the people who can be a four-year boy unwrapping his toy and the entire world is watching him and whichever toy he prefers, they go and buy it. So maybe Michael Jackson selling Pepsi at that time was very much powerful, but now that kid who has no uh, standing, he has done nothing in his life but just to open those boxes. So I would put the question to us that as Coke, as a company, how do you see these influencers? Who are these influencers? And are they that important in the next marketing uh, era? Very, very important question. Um, so I think the last about two to three years we have seen the rise of influencer mar marketing. Uh, they are, they have become important. Uh, I think most of the companies and most of the big brands, uh, they in, started to invest behind influencers. Um, but this is just the beginning. I think as, as marketing leaders, our job is to predict what will happen in the next five to 10 years. And when you kind of fast forward, uh, let's think about year 2025, and uh, at that time, what will be the primary source of convincing someone else? And I use this word because uh, if you, try to, if you try to say, what is marketing? And the marketing is basically to change, trying to influence someone to change their behavior or attitude, right? And therefore, how will you be convincing someone else in about five to 10 years? And at that time, you would try to go to the person that they believe in. Uh, and who do they believe in today? Uh, there is, a, as I said earlier, there is a distrust of big names. Uh, whether it's the government, media, and so on and so forth. You may not like it, I don't also subscribe to it, but the rise of Donald Trump is also the distrust on the, on the big names, right? That, and that will travel, and that is traveling to, to our uh, country as well. And therefore, you will always go uh, to people uh, with, with the majority, and therefore these referral systems through which, uh, now Amazon is the largest com second largest company in the world, um, and the same is being reapplied to everything else. The referral system, whether it is uh, some is anonymous so that you don't know, 
or these are influencers who are getting famous on YouTube, Instagram, etc. Either of this will be the key. And it will be up to us how do we define it. And I'm sure that you know this influencer network, how we know it today, will not be there, will evolve to something else in about five years' time. Uh, what it will be, I don't know. Uh, but I think to your main question, uh, it will keep on becoming increasingly important and perhaps the most important convincing mechanism in five years' time. Okay. Um, so basically what you're saying, the influencers are the one who are giving reviews, who are telling what people, but I've, uh, the research that I've done, Gen Z has this habit of immediately posting the reviews. And those reviews are instant and they can cause a lot of stare. I was talking to someone yesterday and in Karachi, there was this restaurant which was uh, full every day. And then something happened, their chef changed and a couple of days later, they had few bad reviews yeah. on social media. Hmm. And right now, that guy is selling his restaurant. Now, that is the power of your influencer. And that influencer can be anyone. So, Fahad, how do you see your products like uh, Reckit when they uh, market products like Harpeck and all that? So, right now, they are in, you use big names like Fahad Mustafa, Faisal Qureshi, and they come and they say, okay, you can use my product. Now, do you want to change your marketing strategy to someone like a normal female who is actually a housewife or someone from the house and she's uh, influencing that, okay, I use this product? So, it's interesting. So, there, there are two things I want to talk about. One is the product development strategy. The other one is how to market to these people. I think pro uh, both are dependent on who are you exactly trying to market to. So, let's say, for example, Harpik we market to the mothers. And for the longest time, I think all of us have made TV copies built on an insight that a woman wants to be acknowledged by his family and his sas, and her sas, and everybody see, would, would basically say, you are a good house, homekeeper uh, or homemaker. And we've all made copies, I mean, on different categories across, across the board. Uh, that insight is kind of starting to fade away over a period of time. I think we still have a generation which still believes like that. So the copy which, which essentially talks about, see, your husband is gonna say, wow, you have such a nice shining toilet or the tea is so great and your mother-in-law is actually giving you a thumbs up. That advertising you still see today, which is being applied to, let's say, the millennials. As the Gen Z comes into the decision-making seat, I think that advertising will start to fade away because they're not, they don't like being judged. They don't like being generally, because, because they're so, I think Abbas talked about it, they're so self-confident. They know everything that they're doing is pretty much going through their, let's say, um, uh, moral compass or their, 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 uh, their framework of, of values. They're not, they don't like to be judged and they don't like to be told that you, you will be judged. So, so that's going to slightly change. However, in terms of product strategy, I think one of the things that we're starting to do now is to give back this, um, um, the product development or thinking back to, the, to, to, to Gen Z. So we did, a, we did a competition amongst all the big business and engineering schools recently as a part of our recruitment drive where we said, okay, if you were to take some of our products and we were to ask you to think about one of the big issues that we as a, as a generation or as a nation are facing, how would you actually combine the two into a purpose-led innovation? And you know that, that they came up with? So traditionally, we would use a Harpic toilet bowl cleaner, flush it, and we have been encouraging people to flush as often as you would. These guys came up, and the winning team's idea was, they said, okay, the first problem is we don't have water as a country. So flushing 15 times a day just doesn't work, sorry. So keeping the house clean, hygienic is good. Flushing is not. We don't want to waste water. So we have come up with an idea of a, of a capsule which you drop into your, uh, let's say, toilet bowl, and that kind of creates a big thick layer of, uh, of, of this material, um, so that every time you use the loo, the, everything starts accumulating at the bottom and you don't flush. So the, the, the loo stays hygienic, it, it looks clean and smells all right, but you don't have to flush, you just flush at the end of the day, or at the beginning of the day, and that's it. And we've actually, and we have actually started exploring so their product. Gen Z idea. is more responsible. You're saying they're more responsible. They're saying, "What, what the hell are you to, like, basically telling us to do?" So, so they kind of combine the real issues in the world, and and they basically say, "What are the new solutions that we could come up with?" So that's one piece of it. 
The other piece is, is as, as Abbas was saying, they're, they're just basically, they have so much information that it's at times, if you don't have a very strong um, technical case to build around your product, right? like most of the Impulse products, they don't have a technical case. It's all about branding. So previously it was about wooing them by showing Michael Jackson and say, oh, Michael Jackson drinks Pepsi, so I'm gonna drink Pepsi. That's just not good enough anymore. I think now it's more about kind of becoming part of their day-to-day -day routine and then just kind of building that relationship with them so that they have a soft corner for your brand in their heart, right? And that's what Coke Studio does and that's what, let's say, Strepsil Stereo does. So Strepsil Stereo is a very interesting example that, um, of, of an idea that came through the Gen Z and, and possibly millennials. It was an open forum ideation session. Uh, it came about in a way that we don't want to do just music, we want to do music the Gen Z way, which is not bound by musical instruments of the past. So they said, okay, musical instruments or no musical instruments, a cappella, we can create sound from our voice. If my dad didn't invest me in, in, in teaching me how to play the piano, that doesn't mean I, have, doesn't have a, I don't have a musical mind and I can't do anything about it. So a cappella was growing, so we took the a cappella platform and they're creating wonders out of this. So most of the artists that we're actually taking on board are basically 16 to 22 year olds. And they come up with these great ideas, they have open sessions, and they record those open sessions and put them up on, on YouTube. A lot of people, you'd be surprised, are actually interested in the process more than the output itself. So, so interestingly, what you've just mentioned, uh, you mentioned YouTube and you mentioned how you've been uh, handling this. The most important question that, uh, as marketer right now, everyone is asking, and I think there is a session afterwards there as well, how the media is going to change. Uh, and I'll put this question to Faria first, that there is a talk about complete transformation from outdoor, print, TV. Uh, the, the new revolution is already here, I think, the digital revolution. So there are still uh, people fighting over it that, okay, the print is still surviving, uh, the, the regular, the conventional media is. So Faria, what do you say? That is the same media going to be your priority for next or is it the old media is dead? JJ. <laughs> We have to be careful that we have to take the today and tomorrow together. Correct. Okay, when we talk about a country like Pakistan, you've got 70% of co your consumers sitting in the rural. Okay, so I mean, there is a danger in just saying that these are Gen Z ki habits and they just apply to everything. And uh, like, we are a very heterogeneous, uh, homogenous country and all of those habits. Hai irrespective of age groups, irrespective of gender, irrespective. So, I mean, as marketeers, we, um, while I say that we are 70% we are spending on television, but uh, overnight you can't say just because Gen Z was born with gadgets and born in the internet age, that's why television is dead. It's not like that. Okay, so it's a transition that is happening for sure. Uh, digital, uh, social media, digital space allows you to target consumers more specifically. It uh, allows you, and that for sure needs to happen. For example, you cannot, I mean, for example, have we ever asked ourselves, ki hum pichle 70 saal se 30 second, why are we producing only 30 second commercials? Okay, so there is a lot of, data that you have available for dig digital media. 30 second ads, guys, don't work on Facebook, okay? We know uh, from, we know that the, the, uh, it's not a place to put videos. Okay, people don't go there to watch videos. They don't go to Facebook. Where do they go to watch videos? YouTube, Netflix. I mean, they don't go on Facebook to watch videos. Three seconds is all they watch. Okay, so that is one bit that needs to be addressed. The second thing is that, uh, I mean, we are still using uh, traditional methods uh, on, t on television, okay? So, how do we know that this multi-screen era hai, and it's not just the 18 or 20 years old who are using multi-screens, all of us are. We are multitasking at the same so, time. Television has converted into screens so the television yeah. was a device now it's a screen i mean but the difference you know, is that paper, that's the thing uh, but, uh, you and i you were ta talking paper? that screen has moved from 22 inches to 40 inches to 100 inches now and i was in hyperstar and i was 
looking at, at there and I was thinking who, who buys these screens anymore because the kids like to watch uh, vid videos and movies on their laptops. They did they, not, but uh, you have to take both of them together. So, but having said that, I think my personal view is what is definitely out in the next 10 years is print media. You, you mean to say print is out? I, I think so. I, I'm sorry, but I, I think that, uh, Asha, okay, I'll, so I'll give you my own example, okay? Uh, yes, no uh, in Samanatha, when we were growing up, my mother and father, when we were three different newspapers, News and Dawn and Herald Tribune and this magazine and that magazine, then there was a time when the newspaper was one. Okay, so the Dawn or the News comes. Then there was a time when, recently, in the last two or three years, the weekday newspaper was also finished and the newspaper was only on Sunday. Now, no one has no one read the Sunday newspaper. Okay, and then you've got this big environmental issue that, you know, why are you wasting paper? Why are you wasting anything? This is... Okay, why are you wasting paper? Okay, when you do billboards, there's a lot of plastic that is going... This is your next generation is growing up with this mindset. It is not just Generation Z or the 20 year old. We are all affected with this mindset. We are all asking these questions. Okay, so I mean, it's a future is a shift towards digital media. Print should go. Okay, we need to come up with better solutions of outdoor because that plastic is plastic and billboards falling all over people is a big issue. Okay, so we need to move out of there. And us as marketers have a responsibility because, okay, so. I mean, responsibility, social responsibility is somewhere very big. Hey, you know, you, you, what you have just done, the tomorrow's headlines that I will see is that Faria Sivani has declared print media <laughs> dead. <laughs> I mean, I've said it's not personal. But uh, I'll, I'll pass the question to Haseeb now. Haseeb, as anger of foods, what do you think? So I would say that I think a lot, lot of the panelists have already said most of the things. Uh, you know, the, the world is evolving. We're all evolving, right? So at the end of the day, this is not about, this is not a story of media. It's a story of humanity. It's a story of people. It's a story of how we are consuming media as people ourselves. And again, we were having a chat that back in the days, you know, television was a broadcast medium. But now, like you said, it's a device. You could have broadcast, you could have satellite, you could project from your laptop. So uh, the, the, the reality is, and I, I think I, I, I do absolutely agree with Faria on the multi-screen bit, what we have observed, and I can say this for the two markets I worked in, uh, UK for most of my career, uh, as well as for Pakistan in the past one year, that uh, multi-screening is on the rise. So that's for sure, that's one thing that's happening. I think the other phenomena, which is quite interesting, which is I think quite specific to our country, which is there were a lot of people who were not necessarily uh, socially uh, well off in that sense, but you know now with the accessibility of mobile devices and with internet, what you're realizing that a lot of people in rural areas or from you know socioeconomic C D E backgrounds who did not have access to what was going on in the world now have access to that, are watching content, are quite connected with what's going on. I think Abbas rightly mentioned uh, trends are uh, traveling very fast from one part of the world to the other part of the world. So I think in, in reality, media is evolving. And, and, and evolution, as we all know, means some players will benefit from that and other players will not. And I think what I've at least seen uh, of my time, again, in the UK, uh, and especially talking about the, you know, the whole print versus digital bit, uh, essentially a lot of the publishers realize that they're in the news uh, dissemination business. They're not in the paper business. It's the news dissemination business. So I think you know, with Ali sitting over here, I can say that you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Dawn fan, but I'm, I'm a Dawn fan on, online, right. so I read my Dawn you know, uh, content online, uh, you know, that doesn't mean I'm anti-print. That just means that as a consumer, I have evolved from reading Dawn on a piece of paper to reading Dawn content online. And so, you know, there will be, there are ways, you know, people advertise on Dawn, you know, there, there, there are uh, people who write over there, they've got some great columnists and, you know, great people who write for them, as well as for many other newspapers here as well. So I, I, I suppose my, my, my point here is I don't think it's a question of, you know, 
print brands will die. I think, uh, I, I agree with Faria, I think there is paper a, will die. The a responsibility that, you know, the paper aspect of it could, you know, potentially wean off and, and reduce. But, you know, Times and Dawn and, you know, New York Times, etc., all these, lot of these magazines, The Herald, etc., you'll see them continue to live. I believe they will continue to evolve. I think they'll continue to live. They'll change the form. Yeah, and, and, and things will evolve further as well, you know. I mean, when I left Pakistan, I think there were like 10 channels. Now there's like more than 100 channels. I've come back, you know, you, you know, you and I have had a chat about how your programming has evolved over the past, uh, you know, three, four years. So, I, 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 in my mind, if you ask me, I think uh, this is a natural process. This isn't kind of, you know, we don't have to fear it. I think we don't have to, you know, think, oh, this will go or that will go. I think as long as we're mindful, we're adapting ourselves, and I think we're doing the kind of things that the panel is talking about, being connected, having an open mindset, I think we'll actually benefit as a community and as a country. I, I think I totally agree with you as a marketer. Now, uh, one thing we all are very clear, that content is the king, uh, be it news, be it entertainment. The content is going to rule. So if it's in any medium, it's on digital, it's on uh, television, it's on cable, it's via satellite, it's via IP, whatever the me medium can be, the content will stay as it is. If you get news through your WhatsApp, you get news through your digital uh, devices, it will stay. The only thing, the mediums will keep on changing or transforming. That's right. And uh, as long as the content is good, the marketeers will, rely, will have to rely on content. Because as television, uh, ARO Network, we have been very uh, aggressively working on the digital side. And what I see is that it's not just uh, an, another field, but it's also a complementing field. Because like, I'll give you an example, a uh, few months back, there was a blackout of ratings in Pakistan. And when that happened, the only place from where we can uh, measure our uh, viewership was through YouTube. So any content which was getting high rating, the flyers used to uh, come out every day that, oh, this program got X number of views. And that's how the marketers were measuring the effectiveness. So I think the mediums will stay. It's just that their effectiveness will keep on changing and they'll keep on adapting. Professor, you want to say yeah. something on this? Uh, I just said, I mean, I, I'll connect it from what uh, my friend here started saying that, you know, they, they developed a different product which could save the... Uh, uh, water. Mm. So I, I, I'll just connect it from there. And then obviously Coke, Coke Studio. So in my earlier uh, uh, statement, I said if you clearly remember that, you know, you have to add on social marketing along with your product development and that's essential because your essence of your brand has to uh, live with the community. And there comes the paper aspect, there comes the water aspect, there comes, you know, the cultural music. So instead of Coke selling Coke to people, the Coke studio is living with people on a daily basis, right? True. And all age groups. Similarly, your product here, people think that water scarcity is killing the world, you know, and people are against biofuels and other kind of things. And then if you connect it, so that essence of positivity, the essence of goodness, the essence of the needs of the society, if you take them along through any medium, it is, if it sits with people, so the medium to convey, whether it's a newspaper or television or social media, it is going to transform themselves. I cannot predict that newspaper is going to go. Like in technological advancement, Amsterdam is like 30 years, 50 years ahead of Pakistan. If some of you have lived in Amsterdam, still in the morning, a bottle of milk and a newspaper goes to uh, every house, I'm talking of as of 2018 and 19. I have worked in nine different countries, nine different markets in Africa, Europe and uh, Asia. And uh, it's, it's a very common routine, even in uh, UK, in Nottingham, I mean, you go every day, the newspaper is a must probably, it's big lords living there, that kind of a thing. But at the same time, they will evolve. But it, it, it's a hand in hand that Bottom line is social marketing. The reason why, if your product and brand can create the reason why convincing enough, right enough, ethical enough to live and stay in the society with that mindset, your, all your mediums of your um, um, uh, communication 
is gone on. Now, you know, we are using this uh, screens and the, phone, and, the, and, and the batteries use the cobalt. So before we go too deep into mobile phones, there's already a movement that, you know, poor African children are dying mining uh, cobalt uh, in Africa. And that cobalt is used in your electric cars. So before Elon Musk can fly off in his new electric car, you know, uh, people are already shooting him down <laughs> with uh, the, the ethical behavior of the input power energy of their, their product actually. So you need to balance it out. So I think bottom line stays. I am very firm in the righteousness and the, and the social marketing attached to your brand development and product. You have to live with the society. Everything will come along its, its way by themselves. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think the conversation is going, uh, it's becoming interesting with every question, but uh, we are running short of time. So if you have any questions that uh, you would like to put up to the panel, we are open. <coughs> thank you. So my question is, back in the day, uh, when we were doing our bachelor in marketing, there were two moments of truth, that you have a linear communication and make them purchase your product and then hope the product is so good and build the loyalty with them and that makes the brand fly. However, as we all mentioned that now with the new generation, they're not as loyal and they have so many options and decisions that they can take on their own. I'd like to understand how important then does the long-term brand equity and loyalty becomes important or is it more a short-term uh, plot that we need to do as brands to make sure that in the near futures, we make sure that they stay with us because they might change any day of the uh, week that they have any other option? Yeah, so uh, lo brand loyalty is extremely important and I think it's, a it's an ageless concept, my view again, because uh, uh, I mean, you wouldn't say that about Apple, would you? That, uh, I mean, brands can be there for hundreds of years and you can keep building brand loyalty as long as you are relevant to the next generation. Okay, you don't have to become a Yahoo. You can be a Google. So I think brand loyalty is something which is ageless. Uh, what, keep, what will keep changing is the context. What will keep changing is the environment. And as long as you adapt to that, because remember that the change that comes in the world is not a change that happens on its own or is God sent. It is us marketeers who are driving that change. So the future is in our hands. So, I mean, you know, Nike, brands like Nike, they can be, you can be relevant, but you can become a Xerox if you forget that brand equity plays a critical role in you know, we have example in, in of uh, Nokia, a brand mm. which was known for phone and yeah. uh, it didn't adapt itself Cross and the uh, it, so the, it had the yeah. strongest Kodak. brand equity. Kodak, Kodak. But if you look at Coke, example of uh, yeah. Coke Studio, what they've done is that they've grown their equity Many by just been. targeting to the right audience and giving what they want and upgrading their equity with the right audience. So I think it's again, the brand royalty will exist as long as you are relevant to the consumer. Uh, I mean, may I just add a, a point to that? Again, I'd really urge, uh, you know, if you have to read one book in marketing, it's a book called How Brands Grow by a Gentleman Called Byron Sharp. And, and through a lot of empirical research, because I think sometimes the danger is we have conceptual conversations, theoretical conversations. He did a lot of empirical research across multiple countries, multiple categories. And I think uh, when you look at the growth model for any company, uh, the two variables you look at are either driving penetration or driving frequency, i.e. loyalty. There is enough evidence, enough empirical evidence that has been worked through to demonstrate that, and I'm going to say this with, uh, you, know, you know, it's a bit controversial, loyalty does not exist. Uh, there is no uh, level of loyalty which is so overwhelming that it would override the other player. So when they looked at the variances between loyalty between one brand versus the other, the reason why some brands were bigger than other brands, it was because of the penetration. So there's been a lot of debate around this uh, theoretical construct. Some people have criticized it. Uh, but generally, if you look at all the big companies in the world, a uh, lot of them, and I think the book came out in 2012. There's, there's another one that came out uh, just, I think, a couple of years ago. It has changed how marketers look at the whole concept of loyalty 
versus penetration. There's a huge focus on driving penetration right now because the ROI that you get for penetration is far higher than the ROI that you get for uh, frequency slash loyalty. At least that's, those are my two bits to contribute to the question that's been asked. Any other question? Uh, I have a question. Uh, the academic discussion is very uh, you know, useful. But ground reality to ye batati hai ke rupiah depreciate hua hai to exports bhi gir gai hai. To humare paas bechne ko hai kya? Main ye poochna cha raha tha ke marketing brain sari yaan bethi hui hai. So are we selling to each other? And are we looking at the global village? And do we want to integrate with the global village? And should we be looking at engineering? And why haven't, hasn't marketing been looking at engineering? And other value added sectors that could shore up our foreign exchange. Yes, Avala Mira. I think, sir, it, it, it's a socio economic um, political question. So I'll keep, uh, I'll keep less focus on uh, politics, but I'll uh, definitely say something about it, the socio economic dimension of it. Actually, you said, Hamare paas bechne ke liye hai kya? You know, Umid pe dunia kaim hai, so I'll not talk about Umid, I'll talk about practicality. If I have something which I can produce, I can value add, I will obviously sell. But then my friend here, my neighbor and the next door neighbor, they are, have also something to produce, they have also something to value add, and they have also something to sell. Now you are the buyer. Which one you buy? You'll buy best quality, Good price, value for money, and something which convinces you, right? Now, if I am due to my socio-economic circumstances, again, I will delete the word politics in my country, <laughs> my input costs of doing business is much more higher than my, comp my competitors exporting from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka, uh, from China, uh, all these countries. So how would I produce and value add something in competition with Bangladesh, for example, textiles for that matter, or iron and steel or technology from China, or uh, like fiber optics for that matter, and so on and so forth. Even the best of the global food and beverage brands, <laughs> their packing machines <laughs> and their formula machines are coming in from uh, China, actually. So the, the point is, that it's a collective effort. Marketeer is a person who can sell something, convince people by virtue of the quality of your product, but still there's a factor to it, that is the pricing of the thing which we, if you want to export. And secondly, what relations, what social marketing my country is doing with other countries. Now that is diplomatic uh, um, uh, relationship development with other countries for trade and commerce. And uh, I, again, in my own word, I would say this is basically marketing your own uh, countries. How many ambassadors and commercial attaches do we have with the KPIs to develop trade ties with your uh, uh, different countries in G8 countries? My neighboring country, India, for example, they have given KPIs to their ambassadors and commercial attaches and their uh, uh, embassies that uh, they need to increase the trade volume with a particular country. And uh, my ambassador is sitting without a KPI in a G8 country where I have a potential to export my primary products like uh, leather and uh, um, uh, textiles and, and so on, agriculture uh, produce, etc., etc. More importantly, I'm exporting my IT people because I am not putting in enough for the technological uh, environment for them that they can produce something within Pakistan but if I go to Silicon Valley, and uh, I was in China for many years, and I was amazed that one of their leading CXOs of Microsoft was a Pakistani guy from Lahore. And uh, I was uh, amazed. Uh, the, the guy, the chief of Chinese IMF was again a Pakistani guy from Rawalpindi. And then so I see all these Pakistanis. I go, I go to Seattle, I go to their executive floor. My brother works there with their research and development and I see Pakistanis sitting there, but we do not them, we do not provide them enough technological environment in Pakistan. 
So these are the questions we have to ask and correlate to our policy makers, to our industrialists, to our competitors, and uh, to our Chamber of Commerce, that what can we do to create that environment from where we have a product with much value addition, the right price, and the convincing marketing strategy, and a diplomatic trade relation with a country we can export to. If this whole bridge is not uh, connected in, in, in one sequel, so alone, I mean, uh, then I have to start again 20 years back, try to be Bill Gates or <laughs> Steve Jobs, which unfortunately my country is not producing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like to thank all my panel members uh, for a great uh, information session and uh, informative uh, session. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our expert panelists and uh, moderator, Georgi Seja. May I ask, uh, please, may I request our former MAP president, Talib Karim, and Mr. Sayed Masood Hashmi, director and CEO of uh, Orient Communications, to please come on stage and present the appreciation me mementos. Okay, so first we will begin with our moderator, Jerjish Seja. Next, Faria Subani, Managing Director, South Asia Upfield. Followed by Abbas Aslan, Managing, uh, sorry, Marketing Director, Coca-Cola Company. <laughs> Sayed Fakar Ahmed, Chief Marketing and Communication Officer, K Electric. <laughs> Hasib Ur Rahman, Director of Marketing, Engro Foods. And Fahad Ashraf, Chief Executive and GM Health. Thank you. Thank you again to our panelists and for this very interesting session. Give them a big round of applause. Thank you.